And this is where I was going to update you on the latest developments in the Trayvon Martin case and then introduce George Zimmerman's lawyer, Craig Sonner. But Craig Sonner, the courageous defender of George Zimmerman, who has been making the rounds on television since last week, doing softball interviews wherever he could find them, just walked out of our studio in Orlando, refusing to do this show, refusing to face my questions, because he knew these questions were not going to be the questions that he was facing everywhere else he went. He wasn't going to get out of here with an easy interview where he was going to be let off the hook with his lawyerly questions. And so, Craig Sonner has been the first guest in the history of this particular show to get scared to be terrified, so terrified of coming on this show that he has literally run away. He's in our car right now, taking him home from our studio, afraid to face the questioning he would face on this show. Watch out for wherever Craig Sonner shows up next on television, because wherever he shows up next on television has an obligation to put him through serious questioning about what he's doing and what he knows and the contradictions in the things he's already said on television. This is a lawyer who has said on television, I haven't even asked my client what happened. Then on television, he has said, this is what happened. This lawyer is getting away with the craziest stuff any lawyer has ever tempted to get away with in this kind of situation on television and he knew he knew that wouldn't happen here. He would not get away with that here. And so he is in his car, running away from this interview, running away from what we could have gotten at if he would just stay here and answer simple, sequential questions about this case. But he's made his decision, he will, and he will not be back. Don't expect me to be able to get him back. I'll take him any time. Any time he can build up the courage to come here, I'll take him. I'll pre-tape him at any time of the day. He doesn't have to stay up late, whatever he wants. But I think we've just found out something tonight about the seriousness of Craig Sonner's ability to represent the complete innocence of George Zimmerman. And this case, the killing of Trayvon Martin, is actually changing every day, including today. It's a lot for a lawyer to keep up with, and obviously Craig Sonner is unable to keep up with it if he knows at the end of a day like today he'd have to come here. The Sanford police chief decided, in fact, not the chief, there's a new chief there, an acting chief, but the Sanford police have made an obvious tactical decision. They've decided that they've had enough of the criticism from the likes of me and from the law enforcement professionals that I've had on this show and others who have called their investigation an exercise in rank incompetence the night Trayvon Martin was killed 29 days ago. And so the police have taken to a time-tested police tradition in a situation like this. They don't want to take it anymore, so you know what they're doing now? They are leaking, leaking what they believe is evidence that supports their foolish, unjustifiable position of allowing George Zimmerman to just walk free, walk free, that night and not collect any evidence from him, not his gun, not his clothing, nothing, nothing from him on the night that he shot and killed Trayvon Martin. The big leak of the day was from the police and it was later confirmed by Trayvon Martin's high school and it was that at the time of the shooting Trayvon Martin was suspended from his high school because of an empty bag that appeared to have once contained marijuana. Now, this revelation, of course, is relevant to absolutely nothing on the night Trayvon Martin was killed. Even in death, mm. they are still disrespecting my son. My, my, my. And I feel that that's a shame. They've killed my son, and now they're trying to kill his reputation. Publicly mounting George Zimmerman's defense has been his lawyer, Craig Sonner, who is not confident enough in that defense to come on this show and nothing he has had to say anywhere else and nothing the police have leaked in their attempt to justify their failure to investigate this killing has dampened the passion of Trayvon Martin supporters who attended tonight's Sanford City Commission meeting. 
Zimmerman is not worth the history of this city. You need to arrest him and redeem this city right now. Rallies were held for Trayvon Martin today in Kansas City, Missouri, Rahway, New Jersey, Atlanta, Georgia, Miami, Florida, and the place where the killing of Trayvon took place, Sanford, Florida. Trayvon Martin's parents spoke tonight at that city commission meeting in Sanford. I'm not asking for anything, any extra favors. I'm just asking for what you would ask for as a parent. I know I cannot bring my baby back. But I'm sure going to make changes so that this does not happen to another family. For the Sanford Police Department to feel as though they were going to sweep another young black minority's death under the rug, it's an atrocity. This family is hurt. This family is torn, and the Sanford Police Department needs to be held accountable. George Michael Zimmerman needs to be arrested. He needs to be put on trial. He needs to be given a, a sentence by the, a jury of his peers. We're not asking for an eye for an eye. We're asking for justice, justice, justice. This is where Zimmerman's lawyer was supposed to join me. Let's see if his chair is there. There's his empty chair in our studio in Orlando, Florida. Okay, quickly, here are some of the things I was going to ask him. Who is paying you, Mr. Lawyer? Who hired you? When exactly did they hire you? Does George Zimmerman have a job? Does he have any property? Does he own anything? Did you represent him when he was arrested for assault on a police officer in 2005? Were you his lawyer then? Did you represent him in the domestic violence case in 2007 when he was accused by his girlfriend of assault? Did you represent him then when she got a restraining order against him? You said Zimmerman was injured, a broken nose. Do you have photographs of your client's broken nose the night of that incident or even the day after? You said Zimmerman's clothes were uh, got grass and all this evidence, evidentiary material on it during uh, this altercation that you talk about. Do you have that garment? Can you show us what happened to it? Do you have photographs of that garment if you don't have the garment that night? Uh, do, you, do the police have photographs that they have told you about, that they have shown you, that supports this so-called evidence? Do you, uh, do you have possession of, uh, the, the, uh, of, these cloth of the clothing? Your client was not injured enough to go to the hospital that night. You say that he sought some sort of medical treatment the next day. Do you have those medical records that you can show us what he was treated for the next day? And Joe Oliver, did you bring him into this case? Did your client have a conversation with Joe Oliver on Saturday that got him involved in this case? And did he have that conversation with Joe Oliver with without you being a party to that conversation. Did you actually allow your client to talk to Joe Oliver without you participating? And if you did participate in that conversation, that conversation, as you know, is not protected by attorney-client privilege because with a third party there, there's no privilege on that conversation. And I could go on and on, and I am absolutely, obviously quite disappointed that Craig Sonner, the uh, terrified now, cowardly lawyer representing George Zimmerman has left that chair empty, run out of our studio, refused to come on this show just minutes ago when he decided that this was going to be too tough for him. So instead, joining me now is Charles M. Blow of the New York Times. Uh, Charles, you really uh, brought this story to a level of mainstream media consumption that it had not reached before. There was a lot of other media going on. Uh, black radio uh, hosts, uh, online, uh, all sorts of places. I was seeing a lot of stuff online, but you raised it to another level. You also uh, went to Florida this weekend to talk to the family. Right. I talked to his mother and his grandmother. And, and what's the picture you got of, uh, of Trayvon by talking to them? Now, the picture they paint is of an all-American kind of kid, you know, favorite meal is hamburgers and french fries and brownies and he you know he volunteers at the, at the concession stand at the local peewee football team and he babysits his younger cousins and bakes them cook i mean they paint a picture of a child who anybody would be happy to have as their own child smart going to college wanted had dreamed of going to college you know you have to 
you, you know that's coming from a family. They love this kid, obviously. So you do have to take that into account. But the picture they paint is of a real loss, a painful loss. And even as I was interviewing Sabrina, his mother, there were times in the interview where she would literally, I mean, not even kind of consciously doing it, I don't think, she would latch onto her mother's arm and rest her head on her shoulder as she continued to speak to me. And this happened more than one time during the interview. And it really kind of spoke to the pain that she was feeling and her mother kind of was there t as her support. What do you make of the big reveal today that uh, Trayvon Martin, uh, as a teenager in high school in America, may have tried and or possibly at one time possessed marijuana? See, I, I don't see how that has any <laughs> relationship, bears any kind of relationship to the case because his body was uh, drug tested after it was taken to the medical examiner's office. So if there were any drugs in his system then, then we would know that. But if we're going to start executing kids for trying marijuana, then the line's going to be pretty long. Well, we would like to know from Craig Sonner how much marijuana uh, Mr. Zimmerman has tried over the course of his life, too. Let's listen to, uh, to Craig Sonner on the Today Show this morning. I think that that's, that's all the evidence that, that needs to come out. I think that some of the, some of the things you've mentioned are, are not quite accurate. And um, I think when the evidence comes out, it will show that George Zimmerman was acting in self-defense in, in this case. And when the rest of the evidence comes out, the, fact, the one fact we do know and that, that I can disclose at this point is that George Zimmerman suffered a broken nose, injuries to the back of his head, and signs of a scuffle being grass stained on the, on the back of his shirt. That is the cowardly liar representing uh, George Zimmerman. What would you, if I was going to invite you to ask him questions if he had had the courage to stay in his chair. I don't know whether you scared him away or I scared him away. Something scared him away. I'm going to take the credit for I'll it. I'll take the credit. <laughs> um, what would you would like to ask him at this point? Well, I think the crucial point here is the initiation of the encounter, right? So all this other stuff really makes no difference whatsoever. The question is, you know, the, the central issue is, if you start a fight and you're losing it, you don't have the right to claim self-defense. If the lawyer is saying that he has witnesses and the police department is saying that they have a witness that says not that there was a, a fight, I fully believe there was a fight, but that Trayvon Martin initiated that fight. That's real information that we as the public and Trayvon's family uh, needs to know because that changes the dynamic. However, if George Zimmerman initiates a fight, starts to lose that fight and then starts to claim self-defense, that's a different idea. And what we have to under, this is more of a legal analytical point. Can the concept of self-defense switch parties? For instance, I start a fight with you, mm -hmm. you're winning. Mm -hmm. I, in the middle of getting my behind whooped, I start to say, oh, Lawrence is hitting me so hard that I now feel like my life is in danger. Can the concept of self-defense switch parties from me to you? And the other thing is, could Trayvon also have been covered under the concept of the stand your ground law? If a stranger follows you, who you can identify as armed, and the police department has said that, that he was wearing his gun in a holster on his waist. A stranger with a gun follows me, gets within arm distance of me. Do I then, under Florida stand your ground law, have the right to meet force with force? And that is a crucial part of this as well. Charles, uh, we're going to take a break right there, uh, and we're going to be come back, and we'll be joined by one of uh, the family's lawyers. We can put those legal questions to them. We're going to have more in the investigation. We're also going to have Renee Stutzman. She's a senior reporter for the Orlando Sentinel. Sentinel, that paper broke the story on Trayvon's suspension from high school. Uh, and Natalie Jackson, who's one of the co-counsel for the Martin family, they're going to be joining us in the rewrite tonight, if we get to it. And I think we will. Fox News has the biggest lie anyone's ever tried to tell about Mitt Romney. We'll tell you that one tonight. And later, the president's position is now, you can call it Obama. Obamacare, just don't call it unconstitutional. We're going to have the latest from inside the Supreme Court today.